Thanks, Paula. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's really <laughs> well. It's uh, it's a great privilege to be able to speak to you, um, and it's uh, it, it's lovely to be here. I just wish you were here too. Uh, anyway, we'll have to wait for that. Um, the headline of this passage uh, that's just been read to us uh, by Paula is in verse 17, which we didn't read. Uh, verse 17, where Jesus says that new wine needs new wineskins. That's the headline. The punchline is in the last verse of the chapter when Jesus asks his disciples to ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. Uh, all of you, of course, are the way in which God is kindly answering that prayer uh, in our day, and that's such a joy. Uh, but Jesus sends his disciples out in chapter 10 um, to do the works of the kingdom and to announce that the kingdom has drawn near not in them, but in Jesus. So in our reading between new wine and new workers, uh, we're shown four encounters in the life of Jesus that show two things, that Jesus is the king of God's kingdom and the shape of the kingdom that has drawn near in him. So let's think about those four encounters. Uh, firstly, new life. The story of the synagogue ruler whose daughter has died, is told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, Matthew tells us little about the father, except that despite his status and prominent role in the community, he kneels before Jesus and expresses his confidence in Jesus' power. Verse 18, come and put your hand on her and she will live. It's one of the most moving stories in the Gospels the anguish of the father who doesn't hesitate to seek out Jesus and to entrust himself to him. He's the ruler of the synagogue. He has status and privilege and learning, but death is no respecter of people and no one will escape it. He could not be more desperate. My daughter has died. When Mark tells the story, uh, some people come from the ruler's house, tell him to stop bothering Jesus because his daughter has died. Uh, but Matthew's account emphasises that the father trusts in Jesus in the face of death itself. When they get to the man's home, the traditional uh, professional mourners are there, they're busy, and when Jesus says she's only sleeping, they dismiss him and uh, laugh. Jesus empties the house, takes the girl by the hand, and Matthew records, she got up. Two qualities of the kingdom are on display, love and power. Jesus takes the girl's hand. Uh, I, I guess it is the quintessential picture of parenthood, of the guardianship of children. A child will place their hand in the hand of their parent, grandparent, someone they love, and the child's whole world becomes safe. For a child to have their hand in their father's hand, in their mother's hand, is to be virtually indestructible. But more than that, when Jesus takes the girl's hand, here is new one. The old religion said a corpse was unclean and anyone who touched it was unclean. Death doesn't belong in God's world. It's both a sneer in his face as well as his own judgment on sin. But it was not meant to be. And the people were not to become accommodated to death. It's a scandal and an outrage. So when Jesus takes the hand of the dead child, he transforms death, not now an uncleanness that separates us from God, but because of Jesus, like a sleep from which he will effortlessly wake us. When Jesus says to the crowd, she's not dead, but asleep, they mock him and laugh. But Jesus is the author of life and the victor over death. To raise the dead for Jesus is as easy as waking a child from an afternoon nap. And yet, it will take nothing less than Jesus' own death and resurrection to make the dead clean. He'll not only touch 
what is dead and unclean. He will go down into death for our sakes and he will take our place in the grave and his blood will make us clean. New life, the life that triumphs over death. Secondly, new health. Uh, Jesus is intercepted on the way to the home of the synagogue ruler by a woman who has experienced bleeding for 12 years. It is impossible for us to imagine the extent of the isolation and poverty and vulnerability of this woman. We have stockpiled uh, the, uh, uh, the ventilators, uh, but in the first century, uh, there were no antibiotics, there were no hospitals, there was no Medicare, and this woman is a picture of utter desperation. In her desperation, she's imagined what she must do, verse 21, if only I touch his cloak, I will be healed. And Matthew records the briefest exchange between her and Jesus. Take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment, Matthew tells us. Uh, notice that Jesus doesn't only heal her, but gently teaches her as well. Uh, Matthew records little detail in, compared, for example, to Mark's account. But what he records is full of significance. Jesus calls the woman, daughter, he recognises and affirms that she has a place among the people of God. She too is entitled to the name daughter. For 12 years, we can safely assume no one has spoken to her, welcomed her, addressed her face to face, looked her in the eye, treated her as a neighbour or a fellow Israelite. Jesus speaks with compassion and purpose. Take heart, daughter. She has a place. She belongs to the family. It would have been news to her. And then he says, your faith has healed you. She thought that touching his cloak would heal her. Her faith was superstitious at best. The faith that saves is faith in the Saviour, faith in Jesus, not touching his cloak. Jesus honours the woman's faith, though it is mixed with superstition. If you ever have the chance to visit the Vatican, you'll see a picture of the apostle, a statue of the Apostle Peter, and you'll see that his foot is worn away from people touching the foot of the statue of the Apostle Peter. That happened when the apostles were alive as well, although presumably their body parts did not disappear. The story is there so that we may learn what Jesus teaches. It's not our religious acts of devotion that are effective, but faith in Jesus, because he is the new wine of the kingdom, the one who brings cleansing for the unclean, forgiveness for the guilty, life to the dead in sin. It's not faith even itself that saves, but Jesus in whom we place our faith, the empty hand that receives the Lord's new health. Thirdly, new sight. Two blind men call out to Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. Uh, in the four Gospels, there are about four occasions uh, when Jesus heals a blind person. And in each case, there is at least the suggestion that the blind see something in Jesus that the sighted do not perceive. Uh, and pastoral ministry will have taught you uh, that sometimes the homeless can have insights into the reality of God that the professors lack. We are to despise neither of them. In this story, the men use the title, Son of David. It's used by Matthew to describe Jesus in the first verse of his gospel, a name full of significance, full of promise and hope in God's, uh, the hope of God's people uh, for the rescuer, the Messiah one who will establish God's throne and rule in righteousness. They see Jesus' true identity before he heals them. But just as the healing of the paralytic demonstrated that Jesus has authority to forgive sins, so his healing of the blind man demonstrates that he's the promised Messiah, who not only gives sight to the blind, but will restore the whole creation 
as we heard in Isaiah 35, verse 5. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shout for joy. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. The point of these uh, accounts of Jesus' miracles is not only to say uh, uh, he had amazing powers, but to show that he is the focus of all God's plans. Chapter 10, Jesus sends the disciples to the lost of Israel to proclaim the works of the Isaianic Messiah who has come in Jesus, to show that Jesus is the fulcrum of history, the one upon whom all of God's purposes turn. For now, we still live with sorrow and sign, with the death of children and all kinds of social exclusion, death and decay. But Matthew records that the blind were given their sight and the mute were given song to praise God so that we would see that Jesus will answer our prayer. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Here is new wine, a king not for himself, but for others, a king for the lowliest, the blind, the deaf, the mute, the parched, for those who see that Jesus is God's king sent into the world, who hear the news of the reign of God as the very best news, and gladly sing of the glory of the God who has rescued them, who thirst for the love of God and, a part, and whose thirst is parched, uh, quenched, his thirst is quenched by the water that only Jesus gives. Lastly, new speech. Uh, the last brief encounter involves a man who cannot speak through the oppression of a demon in verse 32. The man is brought uh, to Jesus by his friends. What good friends they are. The actual healing of the man is given almost no attention at all. Matthew simply says, when the demon was driven out, uh, we can imagine that Jesus uh, uh, might have dispensed with the demon with a mere word. Instead, Matthew draws attention to the crowd and the Pharisees. The crowd are amazed and say, nothing like this has been seen in Israel. They are impressed. Uh, but there's nothing much to suggest that they uh, had understanding or faith. Um, as you know, people will sometimes say, uh, if only Jesus were here and did some miracles in front of me, then I'd believe him. Uh, but the Gospels record for us that that just isn't true. People did see the miracles and didn't believe in him. The Pharisees can hardly refute the miracles took place. They were there. They saw them and so did the crowd. So they don't deny that Jesus did them. They only deny the origin of his power to do them. It's by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. He serves the king of the kingdom of darkness. Uh, the Gospels record that the opponents of Jesus didn't deny his miracles. They only denied by whose power he did them, in whose service he was acting. Because uh, it's not only the murderous Pharisees who reject Jesus, even while he embraces the vulnerable and the outcasts and manifests the presence of the kingdom. Crowds at the home of the synagogue ruler laugh at him, scorn at his suggestion. Uh, ultimately, Jesus' mission is not only to welcome the rejected, but to be rejected. A man acquainted with sorrow, despised and rejected for the transgression of my people, he was punished, Isaiah says. The Messiah who endures the suffering of the cross for the sake of his people is not diverted from his mission by scorn and mocking. And in the next chapter, when Jesus sends out his disciples, he warns them, a student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. If they have mocked and scorned me, they will surely do the same to you 
Jesus says to his disciples. And so it has proved across history and across the globe. Uh, now this is more College Chapel. So let me make a few observations before we finish. Jesus is the king of God's kingdom. We have nothing to offer except him. But to offer the Lord Jesus Christ is to offer people the world. We point to the amazing things he has done, more to the trustworthy Lord that he is, the saving forgiveness that he secures, the transforming love that he offers, the death-destroying triumph of the cross and the empty tomb. Him we proclaim, the apostle says. Remember the shape of the kingdom that he brings. He welcomed the needy, the lowly, the broken, the outcast, the lowest, were not despised, but welcome. That's not the way the world works. It is the way the servants of this master are to work. Don't be distressed or distracted by opposition. In comfortable, uh, wealthy, secure Australia, we are alert to opposition and hostility, perhaps for the first time in a way that we've never known before. And yet, what of it? As for the master, so for the servant. We ought not to expect anything else. Opposition to the gospel and opposition to the king, whose gospel it is, is part of the course, part of the territory in which we harvest. Remember that we are sent into the harvest field by the Lord of the harvest. It's his harvest field and it's his harvest. He will do it and he is doing it. And lastly, if we are to be sustained in the work to which the Lord of the harvest commits us, we too must drink of the new wine that we offer to others, the new wine that Jesus brings, a new speech that sings the praises of Jesus and prays for the coming of his kingdom, a new sight that sees in Jesus crucified and risen from the dead, the promised Messiah who renews the whole creation, a new health that comes from faith in Jesus, the one who is supremely able to save us from the tyranny of self, the fear of rejection, the guilt of our sin, the despair of death, and a new life from the one who has conquered death and who takes us by the hand.